someone had asked me to. All right, it just nice. told me that progress. Um, <laughs> or emailed me yesterday to ask if I could speak about all parties signing addendums after closing to have repairs completed after the fact, whether that's enforceable um, and what parts of the contract are enforceable even after closing and any associated addendums, whether those die or survive at closing. Um, the other thing I'm gonna be talking about today is providing financial benefits like gift cards, checks, cash, et cetera, outside of closing and if that's something that can be promised on an addendum to be delivered after closing. So as you all know, people are getting really familiar, um, I would say creative with getting these deals to the closing table, pretty happy, right? Especially because there's a lot of delays with contractors and materials and, and lender delays and appraiser delays. So I do see a lot of parties sign addendums to survive sure. after and if stated them itself, uh, the parties can say that something is to survive after closing. Really by law, the only things that are considered merged as of the time of closing are title issues. So that's why we're always so strict about those resolved prior to closing. Um, but if there is a contractual obligation that is not fulfilled prior to closing and a party wants to seek to enforce that after the fact, closing does not completely um, negate any future responsibility between the parties. So they are still bound by the terms of that contract. And as you all know, written contracts for the sale of real estate in Virginia can survive up to five years by the statute of limitations. Um, now I'm gonna talk more in a minute about exactly what can, um, the type of items you would want to survive closing. Um, most of those scenarios I'm seeing are pending repairs um, as far as specific items to be replaced or repaired. A lot of the times we're seeing that with um, appliances. We're seeing that with windows uh, because a lot of times those are um, specifically ordered for that property. A lot of those are back order delayed for whatever reason and the parties agree in an addendum or on the walkthrough inspection report, either or, that those obligations are to survive closing and the parties will fulfill those after the fact. My caution with those promises and the, the times I see that caused most problems is when of course one party doesn't honor their obligation or another party makes it difficult for the other party to honor their obligation. For example, allowing access to the property, right? Um, the problem there and, and what I tell my clients when I'm advising them on these types of scenarios for anything to survive closing is that that promise is only as good as the paper it's written on because really the only way to enforce any kind of after closing issue is to potentially either mediate the issue or file suit, which costs money, costs money and time and ultimately doesn't get the repair done in the meantime. So that's why I think it's always important to remind your clients that even though you can put all the special language in your addendums or your walkthrough inspection reports, uh, you're also banking on the other side honoring um, honoring those promises and doing what they, they commit to doing after the fact. Um, we've actually been hired a lot uh, recently on matters to be enforced after the fact. Um, and yes, we can try to seek the recovery of attorney's fees from that party who is in default or hasn't honored their end of the deal, but there's no guarantee in Virginia that you're entitled to recover attorney's fees, even if you win your case. So that's something to keep in mind too. A lot of times, unfortunately for clients, it comes down to a cost benefit analysis. It's a $500 repair. Is it worth paying an attorney a $2,500 retainer to get a $500 repair? Probably not. And some people just want to move forward based on principle, which fine, if, if they want to do that, they can certainly do that. But a lot of times they'd rather just get the repair done. That's the ultimate goal. So we're always willing to talk them, talk to them about that consideration as well. 
Um, the other consideration or other kind of aspect I wanted to talk to you guys about today was whether someone can agree to provide financial benefits outside of closing. I see this come into play when you have these appraisal guarantees, for example, um, where someone says they'll bring cash to the table over an X amount of dollars over the appraised value, regardless of what that value comes in at. This is causing mass confusion across almost every office that I work with, almost every agent that I work with on a daily basis because I know you guys are hearing all types of answers from all kinds of directions and all sources, but I'm here to tell you today that regardless of what a lender will tell you, regardless of what your clients may push you to do, regardless of what the other side may push you to do, anything being exchanged for the sale of the property that has any type of value has to be completely disclosed in the contract and on the settlement statement. Doing anything differently outside of closing, under the table, mm -hmm. checks exchanged in the parking lot is, and I don't say this lightly, but it, it could potentially be loan fraud, mortgage fraud. So all of that has to be completely above board, fully disclosed to all parties involved. For example, if you have someone who guarantees $10,000 cash over appraisal value, that's not a cashier's check or cash or gift cards or any kind of payment after the fact. That sale price of the property is going to include that additional $10,000. The, the sales price has to be reported accurately to the IRS and the sales price will be reflected 10,000 over on the settlement statement, which will increase the buyer's bottom line by that $10,000 as well, which will increase their cash due to close. Doing anything differently puts you in a really sketchy position. Lender absolutely should not be approving that in any way. And everything has to be in black and white on that settlement statement. And because we haven't dealt with a market like this in quite a while, a lot of parties aren't aware that that's exactly how it has to work. So when in doubt, if you have someone telling someone you or telling some telling you that you can do something differently in that scenario, please give us a call. Um, we're happy to get on the phone with whoever or answer any questions we can about this scenario before it goes to closing so we we'll have that ultimate leverage. For the fact, not to resolve that, it's going to cost time and money for the client. Items to be exchanged outside of closing, gift cards, etc. We don't like it to be done. Um, for example, our gift card from Home Depot. If that is the only way to get the deal to closing and you sign an addendum to the, that effect, the gift card is a different scenario because you're ultimately paying in lieu of the repair. You're not adding to the sales price, for example. It can be done. We don't like it to be done, but we recognize too that in order to get deals to the closing table, sometimes that's what has to happen. That's a different scenario though from increasing the sales price to coordinate with that appraisal guarantee, if that makes sense. It does make sense. I know sense. that's a lot. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's really an interesting discussion because it's something that, and not in this market, but you know, historically, I mean, I used to do the gift card thing quite a bit in lieu of repairs or um, you know, my, maybe my seller will, will leave a $300 Home Depot card at the house for the buyer to pick up or something like that instead of, you know, painting that bedroom. Right. Um, and so I, I knew that it was outside of the purview of the lender and, uh, you know, brokers, um, but it was the negotiated truce between parties. Um, what I didn't know is if I was actually in violation of the law or not. Um, and so... I wouldn't, I wouldn't consider it a violation of the law, to be honest with you. It just 
has potential to create messes. So the important part is that you stress to the parties that, especially buyers, you are taking this property in the condition it is today. If that Home Depot gift card does not cover the repair like you thought it would, good luck solving yeah. that issue. In fact, it's ultimately not going to be worth the legal fees and the trouble. A, another kind of creative scenario that we've seen parties come up with is let's say there was a delay in getting a contractor to let's let's take painting for example um i've seen parties say okay well buyers choose a contractor of your choice if you want john smith contracting services paid on the settlement statement in the amount of a thousand dollars for painting then we will line item a payment to john smith contracting $4,000 and that check will be cut to John Smith contracting. Sometimes the buyers will say, well, can I, can I hold that check until the work is done? And I always say, yes, you can. However, it's never going, you can't come back to us in a month if it's not done and say, well, I'll just take the cash. You are always going to have to pay that out to a contractor for work to be done on the property because there cannot be cash given to a buyer outside of closing for any reason. So it That's does have to really, be payable. Really good point. I just had that conversation with uh, one of the agents here just yesterday, as a matter of fact, because there's, um, you know, they were going to ask for, you know, $3,000 credit or $3,000 in order to have some trees removed from the property. Um, and so, you know, they were wondering, can the buyer just get that $3,000 and then hire the company they want on their own time frame? And, and so I, I told them the best thing to do is to find out which company you want and then have the title company cut them a check. And then you just have a standing credit with this tree company. Um, exactly. Because the buyer just can't receive, you know, funds, even if the seller is willing to give it to them. Right, exactly. Yeah. So that's the big difference is make it payable to a contractor. And I always tell clients too, if you need to scramble to get an invoice from a contractor or a proposal from a contractor today, and you decide next week that you want to go with a different contractor, you can call us and say, hey, instead of John Smith, can you cut it to ABC contracting? We will do that. So we can always change the contractor after the fact, as long as the amount isn't changing. We can change the contractor after the, after the fact, but we can't change um, the fact that it can't be cash. and the amount of the, the check. So, and I always stress to clients, you have to either send that to the company as soon as possible or, or make sure that the work is done as soon as possible because we have to, on our end, follow up on our trust account checks to make sure that those are actually um, deposited and clear our account. And those aren't deposited, you know, six months after the fact or a year after the fact and kind of throw everything out of whack. So, yeah. um, they can't just hold on to it forever. Yeah, yeah, very good. And so, so then, I'm sorry, go ahead, Candy. <laughs> Find that mute button. I'm, I'm finding, I'm finding my mouse. I was on my, on my uh, laptop trying to scream. I thought, oh, I'm hooked to the mouse. Where the devil is that? Anyway, Amanda. Hi, Candy. And so good to see you. And thank you again for all of your advice and counsel. You give us all the time. We Absolutely. Just hold on to you <laughs> so strongly. I wanted to bring up if, and this I think is really important for everybody. If you're listing a home and the seller has an existing termite agreement with a pest control company, Please, God, don't let the buyer choose the termite company at the seller's expense. We have had more issues lately going round and round. And Amanda knows this last one we're involved that we're still trying to get resolved. And it turns into a cluster because mm -hmm. then the buyer chooses their termite company. He comes in, writes a letter. Um, with all these repairs or whatever that have to be done. You give it to the seller, the seller goes to his termite company who he has the existing contract with, and then the two get into a war of who's going to win what, and it never turns out well. So I'm begging you, and I think Amanda 
will back me on this and Jason, if you do have a seller who has an existing agreement with someone and they put their home on the market, you get an offer and it states the buyers to choose at the seller's expense, please cross it out and put the seller at the seller's expense and let the buyer know that it's currently under a contract agreement and hopefully they'll accept it and move on. Amanda, your thoughts? Yeah, I completely agree. You took the words right out of my mouth. Um, even before this whole mess came about with the file that you're working on, Candy, uh, I always advised, you know, never commit your client to pay for a company to be chosen by someone else. You know, it's just setting them up for a fight. Um, and ultimately, it could make the deal fall apart. So Candy's been working hard on this one to keep it all together. Um, I really hate the whole termite and moisture language of the contract, to be honest with you. I don't like the fact that these companies are incentivized to say that work has to be done. So it's great if your clients already have the property under contract with the company, because if they do an inspection, at, chances of them finding work that needs to be done, pretty slim to none. They're not going to say, hey, we haven't been doing our, our job. We haven't been telling you that there's an ongoing problem. We haven't been doing the treatment that you've been hiring us to do year after year. Um, but, I, and I'm not trying to throw any company under the bus by any means, but I think these termite and moisture inspection companies know that there's money to be made on these contracts. Um, and I don't think they're advising for work to be done that isn't legitimate, but sometimes you see um, suggested additions or suggested repairs or installations of dehumidifier systems that are what Candy's been arguing more preventative than required to treat any ongoing damage. So that's where it just gets really messy. And uh, maybe one day rain will clean up that language, but until now we're stuck with it. Also, carpenter bees. Did you guys realize that now carpenter bees are a part of a termite and moisture inspection? I didn't realize that. But this was, I'd seen this that is one that is being required by the buyer's termite thing that they saw some carpenter bees in a shed. And if we want the shed barn included in the appraisal, then it's got to be treated with the carpenter bees. So can you address that, Amanda? Or Jason, have you come across that? No. Well, it, I would love to hear Amanda's. Uh, yeah, who knew carpenter really, bees? I have no it? idea. Yeah. Snakes, lizards, or monkeys. <laughs> well, it made me take note of the carpenter bees I've seen flying around my house, that's for sure. Um, but yeah, they're considered wood destroying insects, and it's a wood destroying inspection, a wood destroying insect inspection report. So even though companies haven't typically called that out in the past, I don't know if this is going to be something we're seeing more often or if maybe the carpenter bees were really bad on this specific property, um, but they are considered wood destroying. So they would fall under that inspection report and then essentially under that paragraph 13 cap. So that's important to keep in mind too. What about woodpeckers? Woodpeckers. <laughs> Fair, but I would argue they're not an insect. <laughs> so, insects so until it says wood destroying animals wood destroying birds wood destroying insects beavers no one beavers I yeah i haven't made that argument yet but i'm sure the day is coming i'm sure it is you know i've seen uh, i've seen several uh well i don't want to say several i've seen a few uh termite moisture repair proposals that come in ironically coincidentally just under the one percent cap um, right you know, and uh, and I think that's that's the concern. You know, are they there just to make money? Are they actually doing what's required, or are they including some additional work in that? So uh, right, you know. right, yeah. yeah, it's absolutely true. So hey, Amanda, just, it's always good to advise ahead of time. Yeah. So if we have um, sorry, I lost, lost my train of thought. If we do have the wood boring bees in there, our, does our contract say termite or does it say insect? It says 
wood destroying insect inspection report. Oh, it does. Okay. Yeah. I just, I don't have it in front of me, so I was just curious about that. Yep. No, it's uh, that's a great point. Definitely something to uh, to keep in mind. So try. I I always recommend that we try really hard to let our seller choose their own company, just to avoid this potential battle between companies. I, I can't stand it when the two experts start butting heads and we're stuck in the middle, uh, not knowing what to do. So uh, I empathize with you, Candy. <laughs> I know that's tough. And yeah. Uh, Good point. On that note, and I think Candy would agree with this one too. Um, just be careful when you say, let's get a second opinion, or you agree to allow a second opinion, because who's going to dictate who's right in that scenario? Then you're stuck getting a third opinion. You know, like where does it end? So, um, and then who's paying for that second opinion? It's all things just to take into consideration with that whole termite and moisture inspection. Um, so just okay, give here's one more thought for you, Amanda. Yeah. When we agree to do the repairs that have been slated, and this is just for everybody's information too, by the one who prepared the letter. And it also states that he has the right to come back and reinspect once the work has been completed by mm -hmm. the seller. My assumption, and I hate the word assume because it's kind of spelled what it means, assume, <laughs> which means never any good to assume anything. But can that termite inspector come back when he does the reinspection and now add more things that he has found? Or is he coming back like a home inspector would do to just check the items that he stated yeah. in his letter and he is not allowed to add more stuff to it? You know, I think that's actually a scenario that I have not seen yet. But now that you put it out there, I'm going to see it tomorrow. It's going to cause a whole mess. But um, <laughs> I have not seen an inspector come back and say, actually, there's more work that I didn't call out the first time. Mm -hmm. However, it's going to depend, to, to depend on the loan type, potentially, if it's a VA loan and he says, I am not issuing a clear letter without that work being done because I'm considering it, you know, whether it's existing damage or ongoing damage or past damage, then it could still fall under that cap. Now, if it would put the seller over that cap requirement or obligation, the parties would have to negotiate between themselves who's paying this. We have to get the work done in order to go to closing. Who's going to bite the bullet here? So that's going to be a case by case basis. Um, and I and we'll bet you it's going to be on the one that you're dealing with right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> Tammy's in here watching with me. Tammy's prayer. We're like, oh, that probably will happen. So yeah, because we'll now we're under the cap. Okay. Now that <laughs> Very cool, very cool. Well, really, really good information. The, um, the news to me was that the addendums do and can survive closing because, uh, you know, I had heard some years ago that uh, the contract and addendums, you know, cease to exist essentially after closing or, or at closing. And so um, I thought that was, that was good, good information. Yeah, everything except for title issues can survive closing. So like I said, that's why we're such sticklers about getting those resolved prior to closing and lenders are gonna be sticklers for their lender's title insurance policy. Um, but anything else, as long as it's either written in the contract or stated specifically to this obligation to survive closing, that can absolutely be done, um, but it's a matter of enforcing it after the fact. And then um, if one party doesn't, you know, do what they said they were going to do or what we thought they said they were going to do, it becomes a cost benefit analysis, because as we all know, we can't force people to do something, um, you know, even if they told us they would, uh, there's yeah. really not a lot that we as agents can do about it other than, you know, try to negotiate, encourage um, you know, I mean, outside of that, you have to determine whether or not is it worth it to get this in front of a judge 
Um, yeah. Because only the judge has the authority to force someone to do something uh, or suffer the consequences. Right, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, if I could just stress the importance to everyone about those appraisal guarantees, though, if you have cash promised to a seller over an appraisal value, that sales price has to be increased to reflect that uh, cash over appraisal value, um, and it has to be brought to the closing table. Anything differently um, puts you in a potential, you know, uh, mortgage fraud, loan fraud scenario that you don't want to be wrapped into, even if, even if that's not your intention and it's never the party's intentions, it's just to get it to the closing table. Um, yeah, you don't want to put yourself or your clients in that scenario. So call us if anyone is pushing you to do any differently and we will, um, get it all straight. And we just recently, and, and the reason this topic came up is because as you know, Amanda, uh, one of the agents here, uh, sent you a case recently where there was a promise to pay $3,000 over the appraised value. Uh, and then come closing day, that $3,000 check was not there. Uh, and the, the seller has yet to receive that $3,000. And the buyer has decided at this point, you know, it's a week after closing, they're just not going to pay it. Um, and so it's just a, a terrible, terrible situation. And it was not included on the closing statement or in the sale price of the property. So, and yeah, that wasn't the agent's fault. The lender told them to do it that way. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I've seen other lenders say to do that as well, because yes, it makes their life easier, but ultimately it could also cause problems for the seller at tax time because they're going to say, well, I sold my house for 200,000, not, not 190, but my settlement statement is saying 190. So, you know, that's where it can create another mess as well don't let people push you into that scenario. Um, it's, and also don't forget if it's an FHA or a VA loan, mm -hmm. you can't enforce it even if the buyer said they would do it because of the amendatory clause in the contract. Right. They can yeah. say they're going to do it, but if it comes right down to it, the buyer can say, well, it's unenforceable. I'm not paying it. Tough's your luck. And that, uh, that seems to be where we find ourselves in this particular case. So really, really tough. I, I spoke to uh, the other broker at the other brokerage, and uh, she explained to me that she's spoken with the, uh, the buyer who now lives in the property, and they have uh, made it clear that uh, they have no intention of uh, delivering that $3,000 cashier check to the seller. So yeah, and uh, you know their position is take it to court. You know, is it worth it? So yeah, it's really unfortunate. That's bad situation to get your clients into. So yeah. any any more questions, you guys? Any any more any more thoughts or questions about this topic or any other? Um, really interesting discussion. Yeah, yeah. So cool. Well, I think uh, I. Th I think that about wraps it up. I, uh, I thank you for coming back, Amanda. Thank you. I think I got cut off for a second, but um, yeah, no. I completely agree with what Candy said. So that just one quick note, that amendatory clause cannot be waived by an FHA or VA buyer. So if you have a party that is trying to make that appraisal guarantee, or if you have a seller uh, who is considering accepting those appraisal guarantees, they can promise it all day long the contract and at the end of the day it is a federal protection for those borrowers and cannot be enforced against them so something to keep in mind it's great when people honor their promises um and i would argue that i would love to try to make the argument one day that it's operating and negotiating in bad faith to make the promise and then ultimately back out of it but loan for readers that those uh appraisal guarantees cannot be enforced against VA and FHA buyers. Yeah, yeah. Really, really, really good information. So uh, so thank you all for being here. If there's, uh, if there's no more questions, we'll go ahead and sign off. Uh, anybody? Going once, going twice. <laughs> thank you, Jason, for having me again. It was good to see everyone. Please reach out if you need anything at all. We'll see you in person soon. 
Hopefully. Absolutely. Thanks, Amanda. Yeah. yeah Thank yeah. you guys. Bye. Bye guys. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. Thank you.